Uh, logic rolls the dice. Um, Holocaust denial. I'm, I suppose, in one sense, the right guy to be asking, and in one sense, the wrong guy to be asking. Um, a little bit of background. I was in university. I went to Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. Uh, and I was in university when Ernst Zundel went to trial and was convicted. And I think it was hate speech or Holocaust denial or something. I even remember um, in the university newspaper, there was a big picture of him, a black and white photograph of him with his usual construction helmet on and two big swastikas in his eyes. Oh, they, they really hated him, I can tell you. The uh, lefties on the, you know, in the student organizations and all that kind of thing. <clears throat> But what actually happened, what actually was debated, it might surprise a few people. I would probably say that the majority of the people who I spoke to, and I spoke to a lot of people on this, and even back then I was probably more iconoclastic than I am now. Um, I would say the majority of the people that I spoke to said that this is kind of self-defeating, this business of making Holocaust denial illegal. The Jewish Students uh, Union was sort of saying, why are we still talking about this? We've already said that he, the, guy's Ill, the guy is uh, uh, a criminal. I don't think he did any jail time. I think it was more or less a slap on the wrist, more or less a sandbagging that he got. Um, but if you understand the Canadian mentality, just having a court censure you without any penalty applied at all is a severe penalty. <laughs> um, Canadians live in mortal dread of being singled out and being said, you are a bad person. Um, <clears throat> apparently, uh, in Toronto in the 1930s, the KKK attempted to start something. They burned one or two crosses or something like this, and a couple of them ended up in court, and the judge says, this is not what respectable people do. And that was the end of the clan in Canada, at least the real clan in the 1930s, where you know, it was quite popular in the States. Um, <clears throat> but it, it's funny, it wasn't as if everyone was in a huge huff about Zondel. It was just a big controversial subject. It's you know, one of those things, you know, it's sort of the affaire Dreyfus of my generation was Ernst Zondel and his Holocaust denial and what ought to be done about it. It was generally, I think, the consensus generally was, this is a very messy solution, but we're going to nail him for Holocaust denial and keep these laws on the books. But really, the guy's just an idiot who, you know, he's no threat to anybody. Nobody's ever going to fall for what he says. Uh, he has, you know, he has even less charisma than I do. Um, you know, just uh, lunatic fringe stuff. Um, but how do you deal with people like that? Now, on the wider issue of Holocaust denial itself, I'm equally ambivalent. On the surface of it, I'm sort of, okay, bring it on. Deny away. I'll take you on. I'm not an expert on the Holocaust, but I, I could hold my own in a discussion on it. I could hold my, my, hold my own in a discussion on the rise of Nazi, Nazi Germany and you know, whose fault it was, or if you want to look for fault. Um, and I could also hold my own in a discussion on what should we do afterwards as democratic societies in dealing with it. Now, the, the thing about the Nazis is um, one of the problems w when facing their rise is, well, the fact that they at least were quasi-legal in their seizure of power. They did... Um, sort of adhere to the rules of democracy, but not really. Um, you know, when you go to cast your vote in a small German farming community and there's nine gorillas standing around the ballot box telling you that you better bloody well vote a certain way or, um, you know, something might happen to your barn, well, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know if you can call that a fair election. Um, but, you know, Everybody, even to this day, they scare you into voting for one party or the other. You know, they want to say they're out to get you, so you better vote for us, which is a threat as well. You know, a threat of violence is, you know, overt violence or arson or whatever in this case is, you know, a threat. And also saying, vote for me or they will get you, which is what our politicians in Canada do, uh, is coercion too. It's just a more subtle form of coercion. 
Um, <clears throat> so I would say that um, in a perfect world, I wouldn't have anything, any hate speech at all, or any speech at all, penalized because, well, how else are we going to deal with unpopular ideas other than debating them? And if you make it illegal to put forward an unpopular or controversial point of view, then nothing ever gets debated and nothing ever gets solved. Um, <clears throat> I'm Mr. Social Contract, and the social contract is all about renegotiating itself every second of every day. Um, if somebody didn't think that, or if somebody said that the Holocaust never happened, I'd like to, to hear their evidence, that's all. I'm sorry if that's a disappointment, but I'm not the sort that's likely to have a fit if you say the Holocaust never happened. You will have to justify that to me, of course. Um, and <clears throat> I would, you, you'd, you know, you'd have to come up with some pretty good evidence to, to open my eyes if, you, if that's how you see it on, on the Holocaust. Uh, I'm convinced that it happened and the historical record seems pretty unarguable. Um, I've read the literature or some of the deniers and none of it's very convincing. Um, usually what, usually the deniers will say, oh, well, it wasn't six million, it was four million or whatever, or two million or one million or whatever, you know. Um, as to it just didn't happen, period? I don't know. I think anybody who, you, know, you might as well say the Second World War never happened. I suppose there are those who believe that. I mentioned in the uh, comment section of a previous video, there are people who say that the Great Famine, the Irish potato famine, never actually happened that it was mismanagement or overpopulation or something like that. Basically, the destitute Irish peasantry brought the whole thing on themselves. Or it just didn't happen. <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, I managed to consciously shake off the bitterness that animated many people in my community for a century and a half, I guess. Um, that's one of the reasons why I actually moved to England for a while, to get over that. Um, <clears throat> but. Now, honestly, I think I would just say, okay, wh why do you believe that? You know, why do you believe that the Great Famine didn't happen or that, you know, it was just stupid Irish peasants having too many kids because they were brain-dead Catholics brainwashed by their priests or, I don't know, they, they, they didn't want to farm properly or they, they, you know, relied too heavily on one crop or whatever. Um, you know, if, if you want to put forward that case, that's fine. I'll, uh, I'll you know, I'll debate you on that. Um, if this wasn't broadcast for all the world to see, um, I might actually go one-on-one -on -one in a debate of, over whether or not the Holocaust happened. Um, I'm not the sort that's likely to fly into a rage over it, that's for sure. And when I said, did I just read that? Did you just ask me if the Holocaust actually happened? I wasn't angry. I was just saying, oh boy, this fellow is rash if he's willing to say things like that uh, right out in the open. Um, it may have gotten you blocked from my channel. You'll notice that I block people who are racists or homophobic or you know, otherwise politically incorrect, not because I'm enraged by it, but I really don't need that kind of <laughs> scrutiny on my channel. Um, one on one, I'll discuss all kinds of things. Look at my channel in the past. I've discussed things like race realism, and I've taken a point of view that a lot of people would really have huge issues with. Um, it might not be what you think either. I think race realism is a, I don't know, form of insanity. But I'm not the one who's likely to denounce anybody for holding that position. I'm willing to get down there in the muck with you and debate this issue if you want. Uh, race realism, as I understand it, isn't a, uh, isn't a, p a punishable offense, but I know that it's not the sort of position that's likely to win you any friends. <laughs> and a lot of my friends have told me that even dignifying such people, race realists, with a response, with a measured you know, response, a research response, um, is a very bad idea because you're simply engaging them in their blasphemies. That race realism is an anathema, it's haram, it's just not allowed, end of story, and 
we should actually go crazy whenever someone tries to discuss it. <clears throat> um, but I get right down and dirty with them and uh, <laughs> uh, I'm willing to discuss it. So if I'm willing to discuss that, I think I'd be willing to discuss Holocaust denial. Um, but <sighs> the historical record seems so overwhelming. And, and again, I, 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 I understand that people might be sort of worried about implications of legalities, free speech, uh, ability to, you know, freedom of dissent, that kind of thing. I get that. And, and, and that was thoroughly discussed when Ernst Zundel was um, placed on trial or sanctioned or censured or whatever it was by uh, both uh, an actual court and a court of public opinion. Um, and <laughs> the neo-Nazis that you refer to in Canada, and we have quite a few of them here, I must say, for some reason the the rest of the world seems to think that Canada is a racism-free society, and uh, it ain't. <laughs> um, I think I got into trouble when I implied that the Europeans were racist because I wasn't clear on pointing out the real everyday racism that exists here in Canada. Um, but uh, yeah, and we do have fairly stringent laws on hate, hate speech and stuff like that here, which I kind of support, but only in terms of their utility in keeping Canadian society from fragmenting <laughs> in a bad way, in a Hobbesian kind of way. Um, same thing as I said about Ernst Zundel. Okay, in a perfect world, you should be able to say this, Mr. Zundel, but the problem is we live in the real world and what you say may have actual implications, although you yourself are a bit of a joke, a bad joke, but you're, you know, you're just some twerp in a construction helmet, and what are you going to do? Uh, okay, we'll send you back to Germany. Oh, they don't want you. Uh, <laughs> all right. <clears throat> so, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to discuss it. Um, I think on balance, and this is not this is not an absolute position here, but I think on balance, our, the hate speech laws and laws about Holocaust denial and stuff like that, I won't say that they're actually sound, but I might say that they're necessary, at least as things stand now. Um simply because of what might happen. I, I don't see laws against Holocaust denial as an onerous restriction on freedom of speech. Um, and I don't see it as a sort of a slippery slope thing. Um, and I don't see it as, um, as the sort of thing that is an actual serious restriction on many people in our society. Uh, it's certainly no more of a restriction than the changing seasons are to all of us here in Canada. Um, a bigger impediment in everyone's life is the ferocity of the Canadian winter. So, okay, if I can't beak off about, you know, the Holocaust never happened or whatever on YouTube, well, that's not going to destroy my life. Um, <clears throat> but the implications of allowing, you know, I don't know, too much free speech, um, boy, am I going to get in trouble for that. Or or trying to give democratic rights to people who would then use those rights to subvert democracy. This is kind of the issue that the Arab Spring is dealing with right now and its hangover. Um, you know, the military governments in these places get kicked out and then they have an election and people who say that I'm going to dismantle democracy get elected. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we'll have a free election to see who our next dictator is. That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Um, so yeah, I think that sometimes you have to have restrictions on freedom in order to preserve freedom. You have to have, well, you know, it's just all things in moderation made in Agan again, isn't it? It's just, we can't go overboard on this. Um, we can't go overboard on freedom. We can't go overboard on unfreedom. Um, so yeah, I, I guardedly I'll say yeah I think that it, it should be considered illegal simply for the damage that it might cause but I'm not blind to the fact that there is a vested interest in keeping criticism of anything having anything to do with Israel down I understand that the Israeli lobby if you want to call it that in in most countries uh, has a job to do Israel is a country that is utterly and totally at the mercy of Western public opinion they live and they die based on what the West thinks of them. So they have a vested interest in influencing 
public opinion in these places. So I won't say that I believe in a conspiracy, but I do believe that that the Israel lobby is interested in shaping public opinion in Canada. And I do believe that there are those out there who think that the um, Holocaust denial bit um, might be a means of sanctioning criticism of anything to do with Israel. Maybe. Um, <clears throat> but I've also spoken to Jewish people who are not opposed to Holocaust denial. They, they, they feel the same way that I would, I suppose, or maybe even more liberal about it than I would. Uh, they, you know, just let them speak, you know, don't shout them down, just show, show everybody that their theories are rubbish. Um, and, you know, that's actually the best way to deal with this kind of thing. Um, and that ultimately shutting people down like this or shutting them up creates something of a pressure cooker and, you know, something of a martyr complex on behalf of some people. Uh, they certainly become martyrs to the extreme right here in Canada. Ernst Zundel is kind of a favorite of the uh, Aryan whatever types here in Canada. Um, and, uh, you know, there is there are dangers involved in, in restricting people's freedom of speech because, you know, you got to be careful when, when you apply these things. I think this, this should be left strictly to the courts, but, uh, you know, not, not to Parliament, for example. It's, you know... This is too serious. This is a, an attempt on someone's actual rights to restrict their freedom of speech. So it shouldn't be done half-heartedly. It shouldn't be done without due consideration. Um, but, you know, if you have to do things like that, sometimes you have to. Like, for example, when Britain was facing national extinction when fighting the Nazis, all kinds of restrictions were placed on people's freedom of speech and freedom of expression and things like that. Um, but Britain booted out a sitting prime minister in the middle of a war for its life. So, you know, it, it's not as if Britain became a dictatorship during the Second World War. I know there's probably British people that will disagree with that, but by and large, Britain remained a democracy throughout the Second World War, even though anybody who ever wore a black shirt in the 1930s ended up interned. Um, you know, lots of other people ended up in internment camps in the UK, or they were sent to Canada, a lot of them were, actually, um, <clears throat> where they supposedly weren't able to escape from, but they did anyway. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, I, I don't think that the slippery slope is applicable in this case. Uh, if you're, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see the same freedom versus security that a lot of people in the English-speaking world see. Again, I point to the continental European republics, in particular the French Republic. Um, that, the debate of freedom versus security is not really one that the French public is interested in having. I think that, I believe that they, they, they certainly come down on the side of security. And one of the things that they think is one of the, one of the admirable things about their republic is that they believe that it can produce both freedom and security. Um, in spite of the fact that the, that the French didn't really do that well militarily in the Second World War, there were a couple of ferocious wars that they fought uh, with you know, their neighbors. Uh, for example, uh, the wars that um, took place during the French Revolutionary period, and um, especially the First World War, where um, the Republic was perfectly capable of maintaining uh, democracy and fighting ferociously with all of its, you know, pistons firing. Um, it, that was that's you know one of the, supposedly one of the genius. Uh, aspects of the French Republic is the fact that they can balance, or not even balance, but they can include both security and freedom in there. Um, <clears throat> and I think that that's a legitimate uh, view of the French Republic and many other continental European republics. Uh, it's just, okay, just because we will restrict your freedom, it doesn't automatically mean that we're no better than Nazis. In fact, Germany and France uh, restricted uh, human freedom before the, before the Second World War, during, in the first year of the Second World War, in order to fight the Nazis. <laughs> um, 
Maurice Thérèse, the head of the French Communist Party, was thrown in jail, or almost. He had to desert from the French army in order to avoid being thrown in jail, and he fled to Moscow because he was going to be thrown in jail for opposing the war with Germany at the time. Germany and Russia, the USSR, were allies, and the communists were spreading anti-peace, anti-war, <laughs> anti-war propaganda in the French army to sort of demoralize the French in anticipation of the German attack. And a lot of French communists, some of them were even shot, um, were arrested, uh, interned, jailed, that kind of thing, for that kind of thing, for expressing sentiments against war with Nazi Germany. <clears throat> and these were the communists who were doing this. Uh, the, the rest of the people on the French left were appalled by this and you know, were perfectly willing to cooperate with the French far right in the persecution of the communists. Um, personally, I have no sympathy whatsoever for the French communists of the 1930s, given what was going on in the USSR at the time. Um, but anyway, um, I'm not frightened of, of restrictions on our freedom of expression. And I'm not frightened of the idea of debating the historicity of the, the Holocaust. So I'm sorry, I'm not going to give you your angry rant. Uh, you picked the wrong way to sort of get my goat. <laughs> um, it's not really an issue, like it's, it's an issue that I have definite opinions on, but it's not something that I feel terribly morally or emotionally strong about. I see that there are cases to be made in, in both sides. There was a movie out there called Skokie, uh, where John Zunza, I think, played a, um, a neo-Nazi, or an actual Nazi, I think he was an actual Nazi, who wanted to march through Skokie, Indiana, uh, I think it was Indiana or Illinois or something like this, that had a large proportion, the inhabitants were Holocaust victims. And there was a debate in the Jewish community in Skokie saying, should we allow this? Should we, should we bust these people's heads? And a lot of people in the Jewish community said no, because Germany already was a dictatorship before Hitler took over, and it was a dictatorship. Um, it was a civilian dictatorship before Hitler got in, uh, into power. And restricting freedom of speech in that sense, they believed, and I disagree with them, uh, might actually be playing directly into the hands of totalitarians. Oh, uh, I, I uttered the T-word. Um, logic rolls the dice. I do not believe you're a totalitarian. Although, I don't know, I don't know that you're not one, but I don't, I, when I say that I, I believe that that's a totalitarian expression, or that that could lead to totalitarian sentiments, or that is the kind of argument that's used to underpin totalitarian uh, points of view, it's not the same thing as saying, you, you bastard, you're a lousy totalitarian. <laughs> not the same thing by a, by a long stretch. Speaking of long stretches, this video has gone on long enough. 